Just one more kiss, Gloria. Mm. Mm. Oscar, you're so masterful. <laughs> Dallas did too. <laughs> Want to see me tap dance? Oh, I'd love to. That's wonderful. Oh, nothing really. I hope she doesn't find out I'm 105 years old. The old goat. And just imagine, they wrote a story about him that you're going to hear on Theater 5. <laughs> I guess perhaps I am the most procrastinating man you ever met. I didn't kill my wife until my 65th birthday. I might never have killed her at all if it hadn't been for the fact that one day I cleaned out the attic. And the reason I cleaned out the attic was that Nadine, Nadine was my wife, insisted on it. Well, now, Oscar, what do you think you're doing here? Well, I was just... Sitting down for a minute, Nadine, I was kind of relaxing. Relaxing? Relaxing at 11 o'clock in the morning? Well, it is my day off. A day off should be used for work. You know that, Oscar. Well, I did the dishes. I made the beds. Why don't you clean out the attic? Oh, now, Nadine. Clean out the attic. So I cleaned out the attic. The attic was clean anyway. Nadine used to make me clean it out once every couple of weeks, but I went up there and moved things from here to there and back again and made sweeping sounds with the broom. And then, I don't know why I did it, but I poked into the eaves. It was an old house we lived in, and by George, I found an old book that I'd never seen there before. The title of the book was Magic Potions and Spells for Ye Complete Sorcerer. I sat down on the floor and started to read it. It was full of recipes. There was one recipe that interested me greatly, principally because of the directions that went with it. I read it over and over again. Well, reading. Oh, I'm sorry, Nadine. I haven't read more than a page or so. Well, stop reading this minute and get busy. And remember, I can hear downstairs whether you're working or not. So I held the broom in one hand and the book in the other, and I swept the broom back and forth on the same place on the floor, and I read the directions that went with that recipe again and again. No, not drink ye potion until thou hast firstly rid thyself of whosoever has caused thee discomfort. Only then shouldst thou mix and drink. Wonders will follow, and thou shalt have what thou deservest from life. Well, aren't you finished yet? The rugs must be beaten. Nadine, you're causing me a great deal of discomfort. Well, well, I never. Still, I might have put the matter from my mind, except that on my 65th birthday, when I was nearly old enough to die, I wandered into the park and watched the lovers strolling in the sunlight, the young men's arms around the young girls' waists. The contrast between my wife and these young girls was almost too much for me to bear. So I went home to be greeted by Nadine. Oscar, clean out the cellar. And I went and stood at the top of the cellar stairs and hesitated. Well, Oscar, go down the stairs and get to it. Nadine, come here. What do you want? Nadine, there are never any passages of tenderness between you and me. What What kind of foolishness is this? I never tell you how much I appreciate you, Nadine. Well, you certainly ought to. I know. You may feel, and I wouldn't blame you, that I never think about you very much, but I do. Shall I tell you what I think about Nadine? Why, yes, Oscar. I think about your clothes. 
Those worn bombazine dresses with high choker collars. Well, I try to dress like a respectable woman. And I think about those long, shapeless flannel nightgowns you wear. And I don't know of another wife who bounds from her bed to greet each sunrise half an hour before it arrives. And then begins a filibuster against sin, which lasts until the hour you have appointed as a respectable bedtime, 9 p.m. Oh, you do remember that our bedtime is 9 p.m. The sound of your voice never leaves my ears. Oh, you're such a fine, sensible husband. You really think I'm sensible? Of course. You were sensible enough to marry me for my money, weren't you? Ah, and how wisely you've guarded that money for me. That's because I know how highly you prize that money. While we're speaking of it, I should add that I am so grateful that to your fortune, you have added 75% of what I have earned in 40 years of toil. Oh, don't speak of such a little thing. Oh, but I insist on speaking of it. And I'll speak of how there's another side to you, too. For you have known how to spend on great pleasures the other 25% of my earnings... You have not hesitated to plunge recklessly into the delights of stew meat, dark green shapeless dresses, and contributions to missionaries engaged in clothing heathens. Why? No price has been too high for you when it was a question of your favorite vegetable, turnips, or your favorite sweet, rice pudding. You have reveled in the extravagance of temperance club dues, nor have you forgotten my pleasures, for you bought me a bicycle. To pedal to work. Oh, why shouldn't I have done all this for my husband? It adds up to this, Nadine. You have been an indefatigably good wife. And you have been a husband. I, uh, I have only one small complaint. What is that? You dust the keyholes. What is wrong with that, Oscar? I find the symbolism of it depressing. I don't see why. Well, you can think it over on the trip you're going to take. What trip? Here, let me put my hand on your back and I'll tell you what trip. I don't understand. You will in the next couple of seconds. The trip you're going to take is a trip down the cellar stairs. <laughs> After I had reported my unfortunate wife's unfortunate fatal accident to the police, I mixed the potion according to the recipe in the book I had found in the attic, and then I drank it. I was now a millionaire. And I suppose that was a great wonder, but I had expected other great wonders, less predictable. For a month or two, nothing seemed to happen, and when something did happen... I did not at first appreciate it. Well, what seems to be the trouble, Mr. Brown? Doctor, it's my hair. Your hair? Or uh, maybe, may, maybe my digestion. Your digestion? Well, now, you are 65 years old. Yes, I, I know. That's just it. Well, at 65, a man can't expect to feel like a young man of 30. Hmm. Well, I guess, I guess in a way, it's my eyes, mostly. Well, come now, Mr. Brown. First it's your hair, then it's your digestion, then it's your eyes. Now, which is it? Well, it's all of them, really. Uh, doctor, what color would you say my hair is? Well, it's brown with gray in it. Not gray with brown in it? No. no. Mm. Well, it, it used to be gray with brown in it, and then it was gray without brown, but now it's brown with gray in it. What are you getting at? And and then there's my digestion. Well, a little bicarb of soda. No, I don't need bicarb of soda anymore. That's just the point. My digestion is very good. It's it's most unsettling. Well, then what are you complaining about? My eyes. Well, what about them? Things blur in front of me. Well, we've already established that you're 65 years old. I can't see anything at all clearly unless I take off my glasses. Uh, Mr. Brown, you've had a tragic loss recently, haven't you? 
Yes. Well, I think you should try to put these things out of your mind. Brooding about your wife won't bring her back. Trying to pretend to yourself that you're younger than you are can only lead to overexertion and a possible heart attack. I'd suggest plenty of rest. Thank you, Doctor. That'll be ten dollars, please. I left the doctor's office. And inside me there was a, a wild stallion of hope beating its hooves against my rib cage. I don't know why I hadn't realized before what was happening. My hair was turning brown again. Once again, I could eat fried foods at midnight without consequence. I had regained the good vision of my younger days. And even as I walked toward home, I began to feel my third teeth pushing my upper plate right out of my mouth. Great wonders indeed. I was growing backwards. I was growing younger. When a man finds that he's growing younger, it poses a problem for him. But I have heard of more unpleasant problems. In the years that followed after my visit to the doctor, I moved from town to town, never staying anywhere long enough to enable neighbors to notice that I was getting one year younger every 12 months. I couldn't talk to anybody about my problem or about my hopes and plans. But I was sustained by a lively, wild music that played constantly in my mind's ear. I had had 40 years of Nadine's strident respectability. But that was all over now. I was going to wipe those 40 years out. I proposed to grow backwards until I reached the age of 25 again. And then, to find a new wife. But my new wife would be nothing like Nadine. She would be empty-headed. She would be rattle-brained. She would be a peroxide blonde. And above all, she would be fun-loving. But it wouldn't do for her or anyone else to know that I was getting younger because no blonde in all the land would be empty-headed or rattle-brained enough to open her arms to me if she realized that in a short time she would have to feed me my formula from a baby bottle. So I moved every six months. And I was lonely. But what lay ahead of me was worth it. As I approached 30... I found it quite difficult to keep from winking at girls. And when I passed 30 and entered my 20s, the devil kept whispering that starting a few years earlier would really make little difference. My mind was set on 25 as the perfect age for what I had in mind, and so, as austerely as any monk, I saved myself for heaven. <laughs> When I was 26 minus one-half, I hastened to Manhattan, took an apartment on Park Avenue, and for six months, I spent money. I spent it in nightclubs and in certain exclusive dress shops. I spent it on exotic food and bubbly drink and costly raiment for costly brunettes. The brunettes, of course, were to rehearse with, for my 25th birthday was fast approaching now. And when finally I went searching for my empty-headed, rattle-brained, fun-loving peroxide blonde, I found her in the chorus line of the Wayfarers Club. Her name was Gloria, and I do believe she fell in love with me at first sight of my wallet. At any rate, she sat with me at my table between four shows. <laughs> Golly, Mr. Brown. Oh, it's awfully nice of you to take it. Interesting, little me. Not at all. 
You're very beautiful, you know. Ah, you're just saying that. Because it's true. Oh, you. I like the way you talk. <laughs> such refreshing unoriginality. Oh, gosh, Mr. Brown. You sure are some flatterer. Uh, you don't know what your IQ is by any chance, do you? My, oh, what's that? Never mind, I guess you've told me. <laughs> now, tell me some other things about yourself. Oh, well, you wouldn't think it to look at me, Mr. Brown, but... I've had a very hard life. Oh. Mm -hmm. Daddy was a drunk. Uh, Mommy took in washing. Dear me. Well, she took in boarders, too, Mr. Brown. So, I ran away as soon as I could. I don't blame you. Oh, I guess I was always a dreamer. I wanted to improve myself. <laughs> I, I wanted to find something better than I'd been used to. Of course you did. I guess I done pretty fine so far. It would certainly <laughs> seem so. You're the prettiest girl in the whole chorus line. Oh, you. <laughs> you have more fun here in New York, don't you? Oh, gosh, yes, Mr. Brown. Fun is what I have the most of. You know, it's a funny thing about being in a chorus line. You meet a lot of men, go to a lot of parties. You like parties, don't you? Oh, gosh, sure. There's always men at parties. You, you like men, too? <laughs> Name me one thing that's kinder and nicer to a girl and gives her more presents than men. Well, only if you please them. <laughs> well, I just love to please men. <laughs> uh, Gloria, mm -hmm. did you ever think of just pleasing one man for the rest of your life? Well, you'd have to be the right kind of man. I live on Park Avenue. Do you? Now? Well, I happen to have here in my pocket a list of the stocks that I own. Oh, gosh, Mr. Brown. How would you expect little me to understand stocks? But let's see it. Yeah, there it is. Oh, goodness gracious. American tell and tell. Gloria. Yes, Mr. Brown? Will you marry me? Oh, gee whiz. Of course, Mr. Brown. On my 25th birthday, Gloria and I were married. Our wedding night was quite different from the wedding night I'd spent so many years before with Nadine. The following day, I missed Gloria after lunch, and I went looking for her. I found her in the master bedroom, and I must say, the minute I opened the door, I got the shock of my 105 years. <gasps> what have you done to your hair? It's mouse brown now. And that's what it will remain. I'm married now so I can be respectable. Where did you get that dress you're wearing? Why don't you like it? It's... It, Shapeless and it's dark green. Where did you get it? From my hope chest. Well, maybe we can get away with the kind of hair you've got, but those clothes will never do at the Wayfarer's Club. No, we won't go to the Wayfarer's Club any longer. From now on, we go to bed at 9 o'clock. Oh, I need a drink. So oh, I've thrown all the liquor out. There will be no strong drink in this house. Gloria, I and don't understand. And incidentally, my IQ... It's 135. Oh, no. I've made an appointment for you tomorrow with Perkins and Daniels, a very conservative insurance company. They're going to give you a job. And you are going to work hard at it. You don't want to waste your life. I want a divorce. Oh, divorce is not respectable. And besides, you'll never have cause for divorce. I'm not that kind of girl any longer. And as for you, Oscar Brown, it's time you stop behaving like a schoolboy. In case you haven't noticed, your hair is getting gray. I looked in the mirror. She was right. I was getting gray again. I was growing older again like everyone else. The formula, as promised, had given me what I deserved for killing Nadine. Just exactly what I deserved. I was in for another 40 years with Gloria.
Theater 5 has presented The Second Chance, written by Robert Sanadella and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, George Petrie, Ethel Everett, Evelyn Juster, and William Griffiths. Audio engineer, Marty Folia. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlas Dotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. This has been an ABC Radio Network production.